Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Dr. Lauren Fishman. In over two decades of practice, Dr. Lauren Fishman has gained an international reputation as a back pain specialist, a diagnostician, and a pioneer in the treatment of many disorders, including piriformis syndrome and rotator cuff tear. He has authored more than 90 academic journal articles and 10 books, including a recent peer-reviewed article with over 1,000 patients over eight years showing that yoga reverses osteoporosis. A past president of the New York Society of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Dr. Fishman is currently an assistant clinical professor at Columbia Medical School. He has recently published an innovative book about electrodiagnostic testing published by Springer. Dr. Fishman studied yoga in India with BKS Iyengar, uses it in his rehabilitation practice, and has written extensively about yoga as an adjunct to medical treatment. So with that, hello, Dr. Fishman. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. All right. So with that very esteemed bio, I'd love to just start the conversation talking about your own personal history and what led you to the work that you do. Well, the truth is I was at, uh, I was at Oxford. I was getting a graduate degree in philosophy, Foundations of Mathematics. Excellent. Long ago, far away. And uh, I wandered into the bookstore, the Basil Blackwell, famous bookstore on on the Broad Street. And there was a book by a fellow named Patanjali. Mm. And Patanjali, it turns out I was looking at the foundations of mathematics. What is a number? You know, what are these mathematicians doing when they do this? I was a math major. I'm into that. still into it. And it uh, turned out Patanjali was the one who discovered grammar. Mm-hmm. What are these funny sounds we make with our, with our mouths? What, what, you know, he sort of either invented or at least was the first we know of to write about nouns and verbs and pronouns and uh, well-formed sentences and so on. And that seemed to me to be really the essence of mathematics, too. If you went back far enough, it went back to principles of forming well-formed equations, these different symbols, rules for how to do it right. And they seem to be that whatever grammar is, mathematics is the same thing, only more exact. Mm. And so I resolved to go to India to learn Sanskrit, to really see the origins of grammar and recognize them. And I got this in India. Uh, oh, by the way, Patanjali also was a physician, mm. and he also was the first one to write in a codified way about yoga. Yeah. Um, the Yoga Sutras, is, he's the author. And when I got to India, I was there about three weeks, and I recognized I was never going to learn Sanskrit as well as the average three-year-old, you know. (laughs) And and so I started just looking not for people to teach me Sanskrit, but people who were liberated. And there were many. And amongst them, I met B.K.S. Iyengar. And the minute I met him and saw his book, I recognized that he was head and shoulders above any yogi I had ever seen. And so I resolved to stay and learn something from him. I stayed a year. I rented a room in a hotel uh, a few blocks away. And uh, it was a very electric meeting. We got along extremely well from the very beginning and all through. And at the end of it, he said, you can teach my yoga. Go back to your country, you know, and teach my yoga. And I did. And I was always interested in going to medical school and I, I didn't really understand how yoga worked mm. and that was one of my big impetus, impetus was to find out how does yoga work and medicine seemed the perfect way and it turned the other way work too that you could use not only could you use medicine to understand yoga you could use yoga to uh, approach many of the problems for which people came to medicine mm. and that's what I've done. Excellent. So let's talk about some of those things because there are a number of them, and I know we have a little bit of time limitation, so I want to get to as many as I can. So, um, you know, a lot of these um, issues that we're going to approach, they have a kind of more orthodox, might we say, medical approach to things. And of course, your work is really integrating with yoga. So there's a more, there's a radical or un, maybe a slightly more unorthodox component. So I'd love for you, as we sort of go through these, if you can sort of highlight what the difference is mm-hmm. in what you're in what you're offering in, in your research. So the first thing is just, you know, I, I was uh, reading recently that, that lower back pain is one of the number one things that brings people who have kind of physical discomforts into a yoga classroom. So do you want to talk a little bit about what your research has shown you about lower back pain, the causes of it, and whatever else you might want to share? Well, lower back pain is the biggest medical reason people go to yoga. 
And right now there are more yogis in the United. There are like 47 million yogis, according to one report anyway, right. which is more than there are Baptists. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there really are a lot of yogis. We're taking over. We're t- they're taking over. I mean, and there is a religious component, but no clergy. I mean, we don't have yeah. to talk about that. Yes. But uh, the thing I do in yoga, the thing I found that the medicine can add to what yogis do is that it can distinguish between the different kinds of back pain. Mm -hmm. Some back pain is caused by a herniated disc, in which case the right thing to do is to arch the back. I'm talking in very general terms. Another common cause is a spinal stenosis, where arching the back is just wrong. Mm -hmm. And going forward, which is just wrong for a herniated disc, is just right for spinal stenosis. So the first thing is something I really added to yoga, I think, which is before you, you can't treat, quote, lower back pain any more than you can treat, quote, cancer. Mm. Where is it? What is it? What type is it? What are the uh, particulars? And you must know that in order to use the yoga properly. And we have used yoga particularly in things like piriformis syndrome, a, yeah. a, a common but relative hitherto previously very un. A recognized form of low back pain. Mm-hmm. Sacroiliac joint is another, where yoga is extremely, it's as good as anything else. Yeah. Uh, and for sacroiliac joint, possibly better. We use it as an adjunct. We give people injections, old-fashioned, normal-type injections of steroids or other med- similar medicines. We also use botulinum toxin. We use stem cells. We, you know, we use... Uh, platelet-rich plasma, all of the very modern types of treatment, which are really good and work very well, but they often need something to carry you forth, to keep you better. Mm. And yoga is as as good or better than almost anything else. Mm. And we've shown that, I think, rather conclusively with piriformis syndrome. I just, um, I had a a study accepted. It hasn't been published. It's published online, but it isn't out in a, a journal called Muscle and Nerve. It's in their online thing in April, uh, you know, the, what they call the publication of a record. But it isn't out in pa- paper and molecules yet, uh, showing how well uh, a botulinum toxin injection works there. But the yoga will perpetuate the improvements which you, that you get with the botulinum. The botulinum only lasts two or three months. Mm. But given that halcyon of two or three months, you can practice the yoga that you would not be able to practice had you not gotten the injection because you'd be in too much pain. But doing the yoga will keep the pain from coming back. Amazing. So that's that's one, I think it's a pretty good example Yeah. for back. Are there any, you know, I've heard sort of, a, maybe this is just sort of one of those uh, cliches that gets passed around, but I've heard sometimes that those that have lower back pain suffer from a not strong spine or the musculature around the spine is not strong. Is that ever a cause for low back pain? Yes, it is. Sometimes it is, particularly in people that have bad posture. Right. If your spine is not vertical, then to a certain extent your muscles are supporting you and not the bones. Mm-hmm. And everybody's spine has a series of curves in it. And the muscles have to be active to maintain them and to maintain your balance while you're in them. So, yeah, that's true. It's not, it's not a serious cause, but it is a common cause, yes. Excellent. So let's move on then to um, scoliosis, which is a big one. So do you want to just describe... Um, you know, for those that are new, I think everyone pretty much knows what scoliosis is, but maybe you want to sort of describe it and or define it and then explain how your research has really contributed mm-hmm. to uh, understanding this. I, I really, uh, I, I, I can't exaggerate how, how nice our treatment is, but I can try. <laughs> Let me try. <laughs> Please try. Scoliosis is the lateral curvature of the spine. It can make your spine look like a C if it's just one curve or an S or a backward S if it's a two curves. There's sometimes even three. Mm. I saw one case with four. But those, those curves, until they get to be 10 degrees, are not even called scoliosis. Up to 25 degrees, doctors generally wait expectantly and watch carefully. Between 25 and 45 degrees, they will brace you. Mm. When you get above 45 degrees, they start talking about surgery. Mm. Um, and that's sort of it. That's the orthodox medical answer. That's the oh, that's that's it, right? When it comes to yoga, we, I, I, I don't think we have time. I'll tell you about my first patient who was, you know, one of those hopeless cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had a curve of 108 degrees. Oof. Older woman, she was dying. Yeah. But little, suffice it to say, her daughter was a yoga teacher, and her daughter brought her to me, and I, we invented some yoga. We said, maybe we'll slow it down. Who knows? Maybe we'll even stop it. And about, I don't know, eight months later, I looked at her, and I said, you know, I may be fooling myself, but I think you're better. 
we got another x-ray and it had gone from 108 degrees to 68 degrees wow. in a very short time thanks to the yoga the yoga teaching daughter who nagged her mother reversing the usual trend and it's the only way that this happened the only way i recognize it it took me years to figure out that this was of interest to the general medical community i just would treat people with scoliosis when i saw them then i got it somebody said to me you know, Lauren, you ought to let people know about this. And so I started a little study, which I published, uh, with Eric Gressel out in California and Karen Sherman in Washington. And we showed it was pretty remarkable. Young children with what they call adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, idiopathic being a word doctors use to hide their ignorance. We don't know what it comes from. Mm. I mean, I have a theory, but never mind. <laughs> and anyway, um, we got these little girls 49% better in, in eight months, a little under eight months, mm. almost half better. And the older people, they got about 30, 32% better in the same amount of time. Just doing one yoga pose, which took one to three minutes a day. It's just the right pose. You know. Are you willing to share that pose? Oh, I certainly am willing to share it and <laughs> climb up Those a tree and yell about Dr. it. Lauren. Yeah, <laughs> secrets. You have to come to the office. Full disclosure. It's the... It's the uh, vasistasana, the side plank. Really? You have to know which side to do it, and there are a couple little refinements, but that's what it is. Wow. You have to, but you have to know which side. I had one little girl who did it on the wrong side, and her curve went from 30 degrees to 40 degrees. Oh, no. I looked her in the eye, and I said, you're probably eight years old. You probably don't trust me, but I would I like to ask you to trust me after that happened. It shows the power of the pose. Now you do it on the other side, and this is going to make me cry. This little girl had eight years, and she had the gumption to do it on the other side. Two months later, she came back. It was 30 degrees again. A couple of months later, she came back. 18 degrees. No. Ah, uh, yeah. So it's one of those triumphs. That's so absolutely wonderful. It's a nice, nice story. Um, and uh, you've got to consider the plight of the young girl. Nine out of ten of these people are girls, and I have a theory of that why that's true, too. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that. Consider the plight of the 12-year-old girl whose body is changing. She wants to look at it. What am I doing? Hey, what are those? Um, she, uh, her uh, intimate impulses are gathering. She wants to hold hands with her boyfriend, go upstairs in the balcony in the movies. You know, she wants to do that kind of thing, dance, go to parties. And her peer group pressures are, are migrating from her parents to her friends, Yeah. her affiliations. And then if she gets above 25 degrees... They put her in this brace, oh, man. which she must wear 23 hours a day in many cases. So there she is. She can't look at her body, that's for sure. She's not very good upstairs in the movie house with the brace on. And she's often ostracized by her friends. And I yeah. told this story to a woman a few months ago trying to sell her the yoga pose, you know, get her to do it. And uh, she started to cry, about a 50-year-old woman. I said, I'm sorry, what did I say? What's wrong? And she said, you just described me. Wow. So it, it's, a, it's a real boon. Uh, financially, it's also a boon. I mean, right now the government spends $7.1 billion a year just on the surgery for the, for the 38,000 surgeries they do every year for scoliosis. And... Um, this method is uh, is just about free. I mean, you must go to a yoga teacher to learn it or a yoga therapist. Once you learn it, you're on your own. You do it every day. Mm. You must do it every day for as long as you can. That's another secret. What's the receptivity been like in the wider kind of medical field? Has there been any resistance to this? Like, do people are people just resistant to shifting from that? You know, traditional. Model. Yeah. Well, I, a couple of doctors have called me, pediatricians generally, not orthopedic surgeons, have called me and said they really like this. And can I can can I see the, this next patient? I mean, I've seen there was a, when I published this small study, the Wall Street Journal picked it up and wrote about it. Amazing. And I've seen hundreds of patients since then, generally referred either by friends very frequently by friends whose daughters or sons have been successfully treated, and once in a while by doctors. Um, not many doctors yet. Some pediatricians say, this is wonderful. I go, this is great. Why didn't you tell us about this before? You know. Yeah. Uh, but many are, are, are somewhat reluctant. I mean, the doctor motto is, be neither the first nor the last to do something. 
Mm. In other words, it fosters a kind of herd sheep mentality, yeah. which isn't good, but is conservative and probably good for us, the, 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 the patients. Yeah. Um, I think we're at the vanguard right now. I think mm. people are beginning to recognize this. I just sent off another paper, 72 patients, and we'll see what becomes of that. That may be reach some wider ears. Yeah. Is there any audience. danger? I mean, is there resistance based on, you know, the the kind of threat to someone's specialization? Like if someone specializes in these kinds of oh, surgeries? sure. Yeah. I mean, as Mark Twain said, never underestimate a man's ability to misunderstand when his job is at stake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not going to sell a fountain of youth to, to a funeral partner. You know, you're, you're not going to sell uh, yoga to Merck who makes insulin. Yeah. You know, you're not going to sell, well, we have a good cure for diabetes, so they're not that interested. <laughs> exactly. Don't talk to blacksmiths about the toll road. You know, they don't want to <laughs> know. You know, <laughs> but I mean, uh, uh, there is just something that is so simple yeah. and artless and involves no gimmicks and no real commercialization. Yeah. And that just about any yoga in, yogi in the land can do. And if there really are 47 million, that's one in six people, basically, wow. yeah. doing yoga. Yeah. Then I think it's pretty clear. It's like saying to someone who sells nasal decongestants, have you ever thought of blowing your nose? <laughs> <laughs> and it's... it's uh, it, 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 it is what you might call a uh, uh, disruptive technology, mm -hmm. but it's not like Uber. Yeah. You know, it's disruptive in the sense of coming up with a simpler solution. Yeah. I mean, if a company were to build cell, cell phone towers, and instead of costing $100 million, cost $5,000, people would say that's disruptive technology, but it's in advance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, as the as the pencil, the pencil and paper are over a stylus and papyrus. Right, right. So let's let's move on now to talk. That was really interesting, and I hope uh, I'm going to contact everybody I know who has scoliosis and tell them to listen to this <laughs> <laughs> uh, side plank. It's so amazing. Um, but r rotator cuff syndrome now, which actually I know you've had you've I, had issues I, I with that, and I've also had a little bit of of some. Oh, yeah. of, I don't know if I don't know if uh, if it's rotator cuff. Um, uh, sorry, what's the term? Um, syndrome. Syndrome. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was officially that, but I definitely had rotator cuff stuff. So yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. What causes that, and then what have you found in your research? Well, they, you, it's, it would be good if we could do it in video. You could see the bones. Yeah, yeah. The bones of the shoulder are extremely small. The, 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 the housing for the hip is this gigantic cowling yeah. with, you know... <laughs> Uh, it, it it's just embossed with a great deal of bone around it, embedded in bone, uh, encrusted. But the shoulder is this tiny little piece of bone, and the, the muscles really, perform, really form most of the capsule into which the head of the humerus, the arm bone, fits. Um, and one of those muscles, uh, those muscles in general are called the rotator cuff. It's like a, like a cuff and uh, on pants or on a shirt. But uh, what happens is that they tear quite easily, partially because our walking on two legs has outstripped evolution. Mm. And so the usual motions of those, those bones are forward and back, like imagine the front legs of a horse or a dog or a cat. That's what the motion usually is. But in a, us humans, uh -uh, our arms go way out to the side the way those creatures' arms do not. Right. And so we are capable of putting vast pressures on that rotator cuff, on those muscles. And usually it's the one right at the top, the supraspinatus, mm -hmm. is the one that tears 90% of the time. And mine tore, and I accidentally stood on my head one day because I missed yoga. My wife came downstairs, and she said, Lauren, what are you doing? <laughs> I felt very sheepish about it. And I suddenly realized I could raise my arm painlessly. Amazing. And I... Uh, had someone do a, an electrophysiological test on me that day, realizing I hadn't cured it in a couple of minutes on my head. But what had happened was I had activated another muscle and gotten it to supplant the function of the torn muscle. And what the torn muscle hurt when it worked because it was torn, but the other muscle did it with flawlessly, easily, reliably, and without any pain. So... Uh, I, I saw some patients. This is an interesting one because I tried to publish it. I had 10 patients that I did it with, a very variegated group. And the, 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 all the journals dismissed it as ridiculous. 
that you could cure the rotator cuff in three minutes, two minutes. Uh, and, and somebody there, I really did meet with professional resistance. My, I sent it to the chairman of the department at Columbia, the then chairman, and he wrote back to me, this is dangerous. And he wrote to the chairman of my department saying, are you sure you want this guy in your department? He's doing dangerous things. I mean, he, he and he does shoulders, <laughs> incidentally, perhaps coincidentally. Yeah. And uh, I sent it to, the, to a yoga journal, and they dismissed it out of hand, too. It just happened. They rejected it. But after they rejected it, one of the editors of that journal, peer review thing, one of the peer reviewers, is a Danish yoga teacher, and he had a patient who had rotator cuff. And he did it on his Danish patient who had rotator cuff. The patient got better. So then he called the yoga, the, the journal, uh, called the International Association of Yoga Therapists, the Journal of the Internet. And uh, they said, well, you send this paper back. We want to take a look again. And they published it. And it's only because of that Danish uh, peer reviewer that it ever got published. That's amazing. So wait, just to clarify, because I feel like we just sort of skimmed over it. What's, what was the prescription that was so that was being resisted so much? Like, what, do, what oh, was what your do you do? answer? Yeah. Well, the first thing is you stand on your head. Mm, in headstand, you, in, in the, the Iyengar Shushasana, where you raise your shoulders up away from your ears. Uh, and what you do is you add in the EMG and other... I've proven it now in many ways. Um, you... Uh, activate the subscapularis, a muscle that pulls the shoulder away from uh, its housing there mm. in, in what's called the glenoid fossa so that you can painlessly raise your arm. I mean, I could not raise my arm to 90 degrees to save my soul mm. before I did this. And afterwards, I just went like this. It was no pain. And I have now about 1,300 patients I've done this with, I've 50 that I followed closely for two and a half years just to see what the heck is going on. Now, the bad part of it is that the, the tear does not necessarily heal. Mm. I mean, I have done a subsequent study with botulinum toxin, thinking I would relax the muscle, let it, you know, teach, the, teach the maneuver so they don't need the muscle to have normal action, normal lives, and then give them a botulinum toxin injection to sort of inactivate the muscle. Then give it two and a half months to heal while the botulinum toxin is working, when the botulinum toxin wears off, they should be that muscle should be good to go, right? Wrong. <laughs> Didn't work. Ten control patients, ten active patients. Only one in each group got better, and one was a, uh, a an, a, an Olympic athlete, a steeplechaser from Kenya, <laughs> bristling with muscles, you know, and he got better. And then an Upper uh, East Side lady in her late fifties. What did she do? She lunched. <laughs> That was her biggest occupation. Yeah, she <laughs> she was the lady who lunched. The lady who lunched. And those are the only two that got better. And one was in the control group and one was in the botulinum group. So it had nothing to do with the thing. Well, so what was it? I looked carefully, carefully, carefully. What was it? I got them both early, within mm. the first couple of weeks after their injury. That seems to be when they heal. I see. So that's the key to that. Wow. Uh, but uh, a brilliant uh, Israeli physical therapist, uh, Tova Ovadia, found a way to do it without headstand. For people with glaucoma, cervical problems, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. So we can now do it uh, routinely without that. I got and I got. I just got a grant, an NIH grant, to look at facial expression changes. Uh, I, I'm going to give. I'm going to give a talk, and I'll, I'll explain that in greater detail there. I mean, the uh, on this same thing. Yeah. So, is that is that your talk for the co upcoming conference? Yeah. So all I right. I won't blow it. Right yeah, now. we'll mention we'll mention it at the end. Amazing. Yeah. All right. So that's amazing. So the those three things, and then you had we had before the interview started, we had talked about some other things. So I want to go into those. So arthritis. Well, you know, wait, wait, you didn't mention osteoporosis, which is oh yes, osteoporosis. Really, this is I'm the big, big one. on that. And I'm going to yeah. talk about this a little bit in that other conference too. But we did this study. I mean, all my friends said, oh, don't teach people with osteoporosis yoga. You're going to break their bones. You're going to hurt them, make them miserable. And so I did a pilot study in my office. I just stayed late and uh, invited people to come to do yoga. And half of them I invited to do yoga, and half of them I didn't. Mm -hmm. and I got a, a DEXA scan, the bone mineral density test on all of them. And then two years later, I had another DEXA scan to see what happened. And indeed, the ones in the yoga group had much, much better bones. They wow. had really gained a lot. So then I got him uh, uh, empowered, fire in my belly, and I made a DVD with some very good people and uh, gave it away. I just gave it to a 1,000 people, made a 1,000 copies. And by giving it away, 
uh, I, I got a pretty good random sample all over. You know, people from Samoa and Serbia and, and the Tasman Sea, you know, <laughs> people in China, everywhere. And then they had them do the, they all did, do the same thing, the poses on the DVD, 30 seconds on each side, 10 minutes, 10 poses. Uh, wow. And uh, two years later, get another DEXA scan. And whatever you're doing, medicines, exercise, nutrition, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. That was a, I would look them in the eyes if I met them, and I'd say, there's only one thing I demand of you. Tell me the truth. <laughs> if you're not doing it, don't feel you're doing me. You know, don't lie to me. Yeah. You know, to make me feel good. You're going to ruin my study. Yeah. And, and uh, two years later, I I was gratified to find my statistician, biostatistician, full professor up at Harvard, found yoga really works, and it works better than the most popular medicines on the hip, and just about as well on the spine, and. Uh, also, it works on, on the femur very well. So it works everywhere we tested it. Now we're looking now, we've got some new ways to do it, and we're including the wrist, which is the fourth. Those are the three most common fracture sites. Uh, now we're working on the wrist, which is fourth. Amazing. So now I want to talk about arthritis because... Oh, wait, wait, I one more thing. Oh, yes. And that DVD, if anybody wants that DVD. Yeah, where can they find that? Well, for one thing, I put it up for free on YouTube, and then also, if they want to, I, we sell it from our office. Uh, also, they can go to my website, sciatica.org, O-R-G, and uh, click on it, and PayPal will take care of it. Okay, so they can, they, can, they can purchase it from your website, but then it is available on YouTube. For free. What would they yes. search for on YouTube? Dr. Uh, Lauren Fishman. Dr. Lauren Fishman's osteoporosis, yoga for osteoporosis. Yoga for osteoporosis, amazing. Wow. I hope and there are some imitations, so you, you get to see my funny face, and then you'll know it's a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I, well, I hope my friend Cornelia is listening for that one. Um, so arthritis, this is something, these oh. next two I want to talk about are actually two that my family is dealing with. My mother has, is developing some arthritis in her hands. So w- tell us about arthritis. What is, how does yoga help that and what can we do? Yeah, arthritis is a condition where there is arth meaning joint, mm-hmm. itis meaning inflammation. Yeah. And that's what it is. And the inflammation leads to the formation of what they call a panis, which is a, a almost an infective type of uh, reaction in a small part of the joint where it's as though you could imagine a battle going on uh, between your own body, the forces of good, and your own body, the forces of bad, some of which are trying to defend the joint and make it so the joint doesn't get injured, and some of which are actually inflaming the joint and Mm -hmm. causing a degradation of some of its most important components. So what the yoga does, yoga does a couple things. A wonderful article in, jur- in, in the journal called Nature, which is probably the premier biological journal on this planet, by Hanschen from the uh, Max Planck Institute in Berlin and Spiegelman from Harvard, uh, talks about PGC1-alpha, a chemical that our own muscles make. It's endogenous. You don't have to take any pills or anything else. You don't have to go to the health food store. <laughs> it's in you. And it is a very potent anti-inflammatory. Mm. You, you, know, you have to do quite a bit of yoga. Many people that are doing arthritis can't do that. But if you're a young person and you don't want to get arthritis, yoga is probably the way out. Mm. And if you have arthritis and you want a natural way to assuage it, this is it. Um, what else does yoga do? Yoga gets to the corners of the joint. By uh, There's fluid in the joint. And that fluid is what bears the glucose and the oxygen and the hormones and the protein, everything the joint needs, and also carries away from the cells and the cartilage the, the products of its metabolism. And it's uh, the corners of the joint that often get involved first, because they don't get much oxygen and so on. They're not getting much loving anymore. So, so they need it, and the yoga sets up currents. There's a group of rather insane dentists who have looked at the whorls of fl- current moving in the S in the TMJ, the temporomandibular joint. And they're, they're very powerful currents are formed by movement. And when you get to the extent, the edges of movement, you get first to the way to get fluid to the corners of the joint, and secondly, to the really big benefit of yoga for arthritis. Whatever else yoga does, it stretches. Mm. And the hallmark of arthritis is limitations of your range of motion. Really, And this increases your range of motion, whatever else it does. Mm. And that reverses the effect of osteoporosis. What about arthritis in the wrists? 
the wrists are a little bit tricky case because there there are eight bones, yeah. two lines of four bones in the wrist, and there are two bones, the ulna and the radius. And sometimes there's arthritis between, like, in the capitate bone, the biggest bone there, sort of the... Uh, if you looked at it as a Roman arch, it would be the uh, cornerstone. Right. It's a big one. And if it's in there, then sometimes movement is not going to help. Sometimes mm. it's going to hurt. Mm. And you have to be pretty adept to figure out how to move the other bones there yeah. so that you're getting more movement all right, but not more movement of the capitate. Ah. So that, you know, you get the lunate and you get the, the, the uh, other bones there to do the movement. Trapezium, um, scaphoid, doing all the work instead of uh, the capitate. So in that instance, it would probably help to have a guide. Or, oh, you need yeah, somebody who's some anatomically sophisticated and pretty uh, knowledgeable, pretty urbane about yoga too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna have to send my mom to you here in New York. All right, so now restless leg and uh, oh, restless leg like and insomnia. Which are, do you think they similar? I don't know. Well, restless leg can cause insomnia, yeah, but sure. insomnia is a different subject. No, we have. I figured out three yoga maneuvers. One is a physical thing, one is a breathing thing, and one is a something that I got from the tantric vairag, vairaga mm. shamans of Kashmir. Yes, uh, and my the favorite. three of them put everybody to sleep. I mean, something, one fellow he went to he uh, came to me. He was a real estate sales. He came to me, he was moving to Denver. I said, how can you move to Denver? You're not going to sell in real estate in Denver. He said, I have to move to Denver. I can't sleep. It's the only place I can get marijuana in those days. <laughs> said, okay. So I told him these three things. He was very amenable. Came back three weeks later. We started to talk. I said, well, well, how's the move going? He said, what move? I said, aren't you going to Denver? He said, I'm not, why do I have to move to Denver? When I use this stuff, it's a true story, I fall asleep before I finish. Simple, five, five, seven minutes. That's for sleeping. The restless leg is even more interesting. Up at Harvard, they're doing, they have a whole group that is studying how does the placebo response work. Mm-hmm. And they've kind of figured it out. It turns out restless leg syndrome has been known for a long time. It's had another name before. And it turns out that the uh, neurology of restless leg syndrome involves nuclei very close it's the placebo nuclei, mm. and nuclei active in placebos. And what I do that absolutely I've never failed with this yet is I give people a little story. I say, if you study desire, here's what you find. It comes in waves. You get a, desire, a wave of desire for anything, for food, lust, uh, dresses, whatever it is that you're after. And then you get a stronger wave. And then one that's even stronger. And maybe one that's even stronger than that. And then if you wait, you get one that's weaker and weaker and weaker yet. And then it's gone. If you study it, don't give in to it, just look at it. I say, I want you to do that with restless leg. Is the true restless leg, the one I treat, may not be people define all kinds of things as restless leg, is where you're lying there, usually in bed, usually your legs, could be your arms, and you get this sensation, this vibration, this sort of buzzing, and you, uh, you can't resist it. And so you move your limb, and when you move your leg, it goes away, only to start again in 10 mm. or 15 seconds. Mm. Well, I say to them, uh, here, I, I, it, I am imparting to those who are listening to this the actual cure. Watch it. Maybe at first you can't take it. So you watch the first wave of desire, of, you know, need, impulse to do something. And don't, don't respond to it. Just watch it. Then maybe the second one, you're not strong enough yet. So you move it. Yeah. And then maybe you do that a couple of times. And maybe that's all for today. Tomorrow, you watch the first wave. And you watch the second wave. And then you... You, may, you don't know how long it's going to take. It may take days, but you know, there will come a time where you can do that, and then the third. And until soon, before very long at all, you're able to endure the entire ascent of those waves of increasing intensity. And then you keep watching, because you will be able to do it before very long. And then keep watching, because to your delight and amazement, the wave will get smaller and smaller. And once you do it, I'm not talking five times. I'm talking once you do it. You will never have it again. 
Wow. You, know, you, you, yeah, you may get it again in three years. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you will, and I, I'm sure there are cases where you have to do it twice. Uh, I did this with a Korean, with a, a very high-strung pilot from uh, the uh, armed forces. And he, so high-strung that he brought with him a cyanide tablet. He was so afraid of sharks that if he ever fell into the sea, parachuted into the sea, if he saw the telltale tail of a shark, he was going to take the cyanide. <laughs> I mean, this was a strong, a formidable will this man had. And he, I did taught this to him. He was the first one in the world to say, this is total hogwash. Mm -hmm. He tried it, it worked. Amazing. So it's not the placebo, as far as I can. It's the, really just the affinity with the placebo nuclei. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. So, so we're closing towards the end of our time, and I want just to give you an opportunity, if there's anything else you want to share about your research. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, the, the benefits of yoga, but is there, do you have any kind of, you know, thoughts or reflections on the way that you see yoga being practiced? And mm -hmm. is there any way in which, you know, maybe some of the norms that are developing are contributing to repetitive strain injuries or things that you would well, be concerned about? I, I, I do think you don't get repetitive strain injuries from yoga if it's done properly. Right. Mr. Iyengar used to say, and I surely believe, you do the pose once a day. You do it right, you do it once, and that's enough. Uh, and you, you make a mistake, note it so you don't make the same mistake tomorrow, that's fine. But if I had to make a comment, it would be about an, an article that recently in the Atlantic Monthly, I think, where they said, how long, they said, Oh, well, there are two trends. One is goat yoga, pizza yoga. I mean, God knows what else. <laughs> I want to do pizza, pizza yoga. Pizza yoga. And also, how long should a yoga class be? And they're debating this. And I, I just want to reply, as I replied in a blog by uh, somebody else, um, Baxter Bell, a good, a nice doctor out on the West Coast who did a blog about this and asked me to talk. But... Uh, how long a yoga class is like any other class. It depends on who you're, what you're teaching and who you're teaching it to, to yeah. whom you're teaching it. And that really you can't measure progress by distance traveled, mm -hmm. but rather by proximity to goal. Mr. Iyengar once asked me, I asked him, how do you know when you're inventing a pose, how do you know when you're finished? And he looked at me. I, I played the recorder at the time, this wooden <laughs> flute. And he said, well, when you're making up a tune on the flute, how do you know when you're done? Answering a question with a question. But the, the thing is, you know when you're there. Yeah. And it's the same with a yoga class. Mm. Mm. Excellent. So, Lauren, that's, this has been such a wonderful interview. We've covered so many incredible topics that I think a lot of people are going to be really inspired by this. And, and, and so I want to give people then the opportunity to seek you out. So we've already mentioned your website. Do you want to share anything else about how people can reach you? Well, should or call me up or go to the other website or they can call up my office. To, I'll give you the number or I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> this is not an info. It's uh, 212 472 0077. And we're in Midtown, and we're ha I'm happy to see people. Awesome, excellent. And you are also, I wanted to also mention that you are participating, you teach in Dana Slam's Prema Yoga Therapeutics training, correct? There, yes. Yep. I know we have a lot of yoga teachers and teachers in training who listen to this podcast, so um, they can and learn from you, and you're actually can, you're going to be participating in this upcoming 100 hours, is that correct, uh, towards... Yeah, we're going to teach lower back pain to people who want to be yoga therapists, or yoga teachers, and it's really important that they learn the difference between how they can recognize, they can't diagnose, they can recognize whether yeah. someone has... You know, this kind of back pain or that? Do they have sacroiliac joint derangement or is it due to arthritis? Or is it a herniated disc? What's going on with them? And it's, the, the earmarks are quite easy to apprehend and, and perceive and act on. Excellent. Excellent. So, yes, if you want to learn from um, Dr. Lauren Fishman in that context, then just check out Prema Yoga Therapeutics 100 Hour, which will be taking place in New York City in the fall, I believe it begins. Right. And, um, and then finally, Dr. Lauren Fishman is going to be participating in our upcoming conference. There will be more, um, there will be more uh, information about it in next week's podcast, but stay tuned for Radical Therapies, which is our next um, uh, online conference featuring a number of different 
speakers, including Dr. Fishman, on non-therapeutic or non-orthodox, unorthodox therapeutic modalities, different approaches to both mental and physical health. So we'll look forward to having you there and um, and recording that lecture here coming up, Dr. Fishman. So thank you so much. No, my it's been pleasure. a real pleasure. All my right. Pleasure too. All Good right. Question. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Well, everyone, that was our interview with Dr. Lauren Fishman. To find out more about Lauren and his teachings and his medical practice, head to sciatica.org.